Welcome to another average afternoon at TFS with another great weld repair. Now, I get these things all the time, and weld repairs for you are a fantastic source of income because everybody has something that's broken that needs to be welded. So the more you can weld, well, the farther you get, the more money you make, and uh, of course, the better cred you achieve uh, from, uh, from being able to be the person that does it. So here we go. Uh, this is the fourth time I have tried to put a welding cast aluminum video together, and uh, sometimes they're you know, super smooth and nobody really gets to learn anything from a job that was just easily done. Other times I don't have the time to get the footage right or the footage is just flat out messed up and you guys can't see anything, so nothing to learn on. However, this old Ford 5.8 liter upper plenum is probably going to be a fantastic example because this years that they made these and this uh, structure of this aluminum is terrible so it's going to be very difficult to weld now i've got to focus on this because this is a weld repair for a customer and uh, you're just going to hear me do a lot of voiceover and stuff like that but hopefully we'll get the good shots and all the rest of that stuff to show you but here's the job this little busted little ear here this little mounting tab no worky we got to stick it back on there and make it hold Now this is kind of why cast aluminum just plain sucks, if you will, to weld, and it's very difficult to do. And when you look at it, you see all this grainy kind of structure as it broke off? Well, all of that right there is different purities of aluminum. Uh, it might be even different metals. You'd never really know what the manufacturer used to construct their cast product or their part. So when you start welding this stuff, I mean, yeah, the majority of it's aluminum, but it's generally like a lower uh, purity of aluminum, a lower grade, a lower quality of aluminum. And when they do the casting, it's, you know, it's usually made out of like sand or some sort of, you know, compressed whatever the case is. And as the metal flows through there, some of that stuff breaks off. I mean, it literally introduces and gets stuck into the, into the metal itself. Not to mention, this thing is like a, a metallic sponge. It literally just kind of traps air into it. So as you're welding along, you'll see all kinds of stuff literally just break free and jump into your weld puddle, like happily trying to destroy it. That's why it's very difficult to do. So the thing is, it's really hard to weld these back together unless you have a really good solid process. Each one of these is a little bit unique in how I like to repair them, but generally speaking what we're trying to do is find a couple of good surfaces to build up enough metal to put back in there that will make it hold. We don't really want to try and actually like weld this back together if you will. We're just kind of making a couple places that will stick and, uh, and actually create some strength back within that metal. We want to put some good metal back in there on a couple of good surfaces. Now we can't weld the entire thing from the inside out and you know do a ton of buildup because there's just going to be you're basically going to make another bigger sponge <laughs> if you will. What we're basically trying to do here is create a, a groove. We're going to create a bevel on each side of the part, or at least each side of the part that we're putting back together. And that is going to be roughly, I don't know, anywhere between like an eighth inch, three sixteenths, maybe even a quarter. That's somewhere between three and six millimeters or so uh, down on that, on that edge there. We need something that we can build it back up with. But one thing I am not going to do, and you should never do, if you have to have a piece that needs to go back almost exactly where it was before, like a bolt hole tab, you do not want to grind away any of that face where any of that cast section broke off, right? Because that actually creates a mechanical lock, and I'll show you why that's really important here in a second. But a carbide burr tool, as you see me using here, is pretty much the key. This is what you need to clean all of this up. I don't like to use anything like a, a flap disc or anything that can present any more junk into the actual weld itself. I mean, it's you never know what you're going to find in there anyway. Might as well keep as much stuff of it out. So a nice carbide burr tool. This will knock down the edges only slightly. Make sure that we clean the metal around it as well because there's oxides, there's coatings, there's whatever. There's oils, there's junk, there's dirt, there's everything that actually gets on there. And we want to try to clean that up around that weld area as much as possible. There's going to have to be a lot of cleaning on this one. Not just from the carbide tool, but when we get into welding, there's going to be even more cleaning. But here we go. The purpose of not cleaning off that layer, as you can see here as I wiggle it, it actually stays in place. It's kind of like a mechanical lock. One side is negative, one side is positive, and you can see that it goes back in almost the exact same place, or at least extremely close within a tolerance. So I'm going to take a piece of flat stock here. This is just some cold roll steel that I have laying around. I believe it's 80 thousandths or 2 millimeters or so. It's not, you know, super thick or anything like that. You need something that's strong enough to hold it in place, you know, not super flimsy, but 
basically saying I'm going to stretch this across that section. I'm going to clamp on the little ear, little tab that broke off. I'm going to make sure that it's nice and mechanically locked in right where it needs to go and then clamp it onto that sheet metal. Now this is going to help hold all of it in place while I give it a nice good tack weld. Now after I get it clamped on there, I'm going to grab a hold of a soft hammer and I'm going to give it a couple of taps. This is just going to make sure that if it's if it was off slightly, which I can't really tell, that it will actually kind of lock itself back in place. Now let's talk machine settings. I'm running my Invertig 221 from HTP because it's plugged in and I actually really like this machine. Plus I got a really cool water cooler and a new torch for it. I'll show you some of that stuff later. My frequency I'm going to drop. I'm going to go down to about 60 hertz. Normally I run these things on like heavier casts somewhere around actually like 30 to 40 hertz just because I want more time spent on uh, each end of it. I'm going to set my balance to 65 and you'll see why because in the HTP and Vertig 221 I have independent amplitude control of uh, each side of the wave. So I'm going to drop my negative wave down to 80% of the power which means I'm going to spend more time on the cleaning side of this which I want and not too much on the negative side where it's going to start breaking up all kinds of junk. It's literally just going to kind of create a nice little surface in which I can uh, I can I can run with here. And I mean that may not make sense, but I'm, we're you know we got future episodes in the works here of why you want to do that. But as we start digging into this thing, you can see all kinds of junk just start floating up. And what I'm basically doing is kind of moving the torch around and just letting it kind of break out some of that crap and break in some of that good metal. And as I, as I hammer down on it, um, I'm just going to deposit just a little bit of metal on here after I clean it all out, got a couple little dabs basically, and then I'm going to hammer down on it. The reason why I'm doing this is I'm trying to force all of the impurities out of there and where it will solidify with some good clean metal. So it's just little dabs, hammer down, little dabs, hammer down, and just try to blend all this in until I stop seeing uh, impurities or there's less porosity, there's less holes, there's less junk that comes up to the top of it, if any of that makes any sense. But you'll see this process again later, but I must absolutely check my tack weld. So after I pull that piece off again, make sure it's flat, nice and even. There's going to be distortion on this no matter what, but as long as it's nice, flat and even after the tack, we know it's locked into place where it was before, thanks to not grinding that face away, then we can go after it again. Now some of these shots, a little bit difficult to gather, but you know what, hey, that's the best I could do for you guys, and they're pretty clear anyway. So again, we're just kind of adding a little bit of filler metal and chasing out any kind of imp impurities, any kind of porosity, any kind of imperfection. The more time you spend hammering down on it, the more time it allows it to actually come up and kind of break through that surface there. Whereas as if like a pocket of air or some junk from the, from the metal came up there and you're hammering down on it constantly and kind of feathering in and out of the, the pedal itself and pushing some of that junk to the top, it finally gets out of there where good fresh metal can be deposited. We're essentially doing nothing more than displacing crappy metal with good metal. So again, kind of light in the beginning. We want to clean up all the areas around it. That's the purpose of kind of running around with the arc so it actually blasts out some of that junk. It like brings it to the surface. And the more we hammer down on it with heavy amperage and add new filler, we continuously displace the old stuff with the new stuff. We're essentially building a bit of a bridge to go right over the top of it. So now just for a little behind the scenes, here's some of the problems that we encounter when trying to shoot these vids. The only, the only shot we have is if I'm looking at it right here. Can't even get it over the top. This one would have been such a cool shot to nail, but there was just no way I could actually weld it with the camera in the way. And since this has to be, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a customer's part, it has to be done correctly. So I can't sacrifice that. So sorry, but the torch is in the way and you can kind of see a lot of that junk I was chasing out of there. But yeah, oh well. Here comes another little goof. We're trying to build up that little bit of a lip on the inside of there. This is just some good little nice little dabs, but there goes the tip and dip. <laughs> it happens to the best of us, I guess. But either way, little bit of a, a build up in here. Again, we're displacing metal. A little bit of an edge there that came around the uh, the end of the manifold. It's kind of like a gusset that was cast into it to give it some strength. I need to build that back up as well. But we're building it up on top of fresh metal, not necessarily all the displacement of the cast metal. We're just building up some, uh, basically a stack on top of a stack on top of a stack. You know, just little stuff to get this in there and kind of build it right back up again. Now, none of this really looks all that pretty, and that's that's the thing. You know, I mean, cast is is it's a fickle metal. I mean, you don't. Ex always expect that it's going to come out perfect, but all we really want is some solid foundation for that new metal to stick to. And don't expect them to come out looking like dimes all the time because it's just, that's not really realistic. I mean, what you're working with is, it's going to produce the right results. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes not. But 
I'm going to file away on some of this bead here around to the edge, and it's just uh, just so I can get a nice clear shot of creating a groove with the file. And as soon as I do that, I'm going to prep the metal around it just to try and uh, clean up some of the uh, some of the junk that's on there. I don't want to get too close to that port. Now the gasket and some silicone. This is going to fill in any kind of uh, imperfection or any kind of void or uh, differences in the height of the metal after we're taking it away. But we do have to clear all of this out of here. Best way to do this. I mean, you can use a saw or a carbide burr or something like that I'm literally just going to use the corner of this file and as soon as I get a nice little groove in there we're going to go right back into welding it now I did speed this up a little bit just so you can kind of see the process first we got to chase it out and we got to let a lot of that junk come up to the top of it and we're going to try and displace it with uh, with some filler metal now this part happened to be just one of the more terrible parts to do so there's going to be a lot of chasing a lot of filling a whole lot of heat but you really got to be careful at the same time because if you get it too hot that entire corner is going to fall away so this has got to be done in steps and processes you notice I can't really Really get the uh, the little pinholes out of it that are where pockets of air and everything else like that are displacing so I'm literally hammering down and stabbing rod in there trying to get it to push but this is gonna have to be done in multiple steps so as soon as I get that one done again super sped up here just so you can kind of follow along in the process it's a little time consuming but as soon as I get that first one done I'm gonna hit it with the carbide burr to get it down to a surface and then I'm gonna clean it up with the surface prep pad yet again trying not to pull away too much metal but there's a pinhole that I have right there and I guarantee as soon as I weld this it's gonna open up even more stuff that was underneath that surface so you may have to do this multiple times and run it over and over and over again until you actually get it right I was lucky enough to get it right on the second try to where the, the everything all the weld metal all the voids pushed out of it and everything was smooth on the top free of a lot of junk so if you gotta go over this several times until you chase it all out that's just the process that's what you gotta do but as soon as I got it cleaned up ready to go it actually uh, you know it's not perfect we're not you know we're not making decorations we're making solid repairs here so that's what you need it's good to go so hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight onto repairing cast aluminums and uh, you know at the end of the day it's actually not that difficult to do you just got to be really patient not get yourself in a rush let all that junk work its way out of there and then hammer down on it and uh, stuff some filler rod in there remember we're not trying to weld the entire thing we just kind of needed to I don't know if you will uh, glue itself back together on repairs like this at least there's some of them that get super deep and uh, you know you gotta actually build them all up and machine both sides stuff like that that's totally different uh, style of repair than this one so this one will do nice flat and even goes back on holds everything down seals it all up we're good to go I hope you guys have learned something from this one so if you got any questions or comments go ahead and drop them down in the comments box below if you need to get in contact with us you can hit us up at the fabricationseries.com website instagram at the dot fabricator or facebook.com slash the fabricator series I want to thank you guys for watching as always don't forget to like and subscribe and I will see you guys on the next episode